Thank you, President Sal. Uh, Abe Walcott, San Jose State University, and Rod Diradon Sr. is uh, my uh, supporter. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Keiston Smith here, President and CEO of Silk Orchard Management Corporation. Uh, John Ball is my sponsor. Uh, now, if we get to invite Rotarian, visiting Rotarian, and Jess, to please stand to be introduced. Got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fine. James Williams with Opera San Jose. Uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce Jay Corbett. Uh, he's a technical guy with this small company called Google in downtown and is interested in learning more about Rotary. Welcome, Jay. Hi, President Sal. Hi, everybody. My guest today is Jim Walker. He was a longtime Cupertino Rotarian with my mom. He's still a Cupertino Rotarian. He was a former district governor. He probably knows more of you in the room than I do. And I'm very excited to have him with us for lunch today. Hi, President Sal. I'd like to introduce Elena Schrader, um, Development Director for Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley. Is that me? That's, hello. So uh, everyone, I want to welcome my guest, Catherine Lindo. She is, uh, she is the wife of Rob Lindo from the Casino Matrix, number one. She also has a, she, a pandemic-induced career change and currently studying to be a court reporter. Okay. <laughs> Hi, President Sal. I'm Sarah Janigan. I'm here to introduce Rusty Weeks uh, with Christmas in the Park, he, and he's here for his second um, second visit. Afternoon, President Sal. Mike Conniff from San Jose State. I'm very pleased to in introduce an old friend and colleague of mine, Carlos Figueroa. Carlos has for 50 years or something, <laughs> something like that, has been uh, CEO of the Greater San Jose Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And when I was at San Jose State, we did a lot of uh, things together promoting business and Latin American studies. So welcome to our club, Carlos. Mr. Pizarro, that's President Sal to me. Good to see you, President Sal. Uh, fellow Rotarians, Nicholas Adams, Classification Public Relations, it's my distinct privilege to introduce you. I think he's been introduced a couple times already, but if you haven't had the pleasure of meeting him, please do so today before you leave. Ladies and gentlemen, the new General Director of Symphony San Jose, Robert Massey. <laughs> President Sal, Timothy Ben Hegstrom. I would like to introduce my longtime friend, Dale Clark, who is the proprietor of Design Signs in San Jose and probably the most loyal Jimmy Buffett fan in the room. Hi, 
President Sal, Michelle Loxon, Boys and Girls Clubs of Silicon Valley, and my guest today has really elevated my status and probably needs no introduction. It's Daniel Zazueta with the City Attorney's Office. President Sal, Bonnie Bamberg, my guest today is our new manager for the American Beethoven Society, Lisa Jofnick. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Steve Borkenhagen, Sal's predecessor. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my sweetie pie, Taryn Corselia, who is also the daughter of my good buddy, Vic Corselia, right here. Hi, President Sal and everybody. I'd like to introduce to you this person here who has heard about the Rotary Club of San Jose almost every week or almost every day for the last 14 years. And today is the first time he attend this meeting. My husband, Dan Bui. Well, he's a youth referee because his major qualification, he has terrible eyesight. <laughs> Second thing I want to tell you about Michael is that he has been uh, a real hero. Uh, he took over as the interim director of the VMC Foundation in March of 2021 when our dear friend Chris Wilder had his stroke. In the middle of COVID, when we still needed, you know, help for, for our community, and the Valley Medical Center was the primary source of medical care in our community, Michael stepped into the position as interim CEO the next day and was appointed the uh, full-time CEO and president in January of 2022. And since that, since his appointment as interim CEO, uh, when, as you can imagine, uh, the organization, there were nerves and the community was wondering what was going to happen. Michael has, through humor, a determination, and grit, and perseverance, raised over 20 million dollars and countless amounts of equipment uh, and um, utilities to help our community survive and thrive through covid and i'm just so pleased uh, that uh, our newest rotarian is going to be a great rotarian michael elliott Um, wow, Steve Ellenberg, folks. Um, I do, Steve. I, I do want to say thank you. I was um, 
I, I very much wanted to join Rotary, uh, but as a first year executive director, I was concerned about limitations on my time. And uh, I really appreciate, Steve, uh, your persistence and support in encouraging me to join. And, I, and I'm, I'm really um, glad I did. And I'm, I'm also glad that you said if I did join, that you'd make a substantial donation to the Rotary Foundation in my honor. Uh, and that's really, I don't know if you want to announce that now or we'll wait till later. OK, we'll wait till later to announce that. Um, uh, well, hi, everyone. I'm Michael Elliott. I'm uh, just delighted to be part of this club, and I've met some of you in this room, and I look forward to meeting more of you. Uh, I'm originally from Santa Cruz, though I've lived here in San Jose since 1998. I came here to do a year of national service with City Year. Uh, I thought I'd be here for 10 months, and then I would leave and go somewhere else, and instead I met my wife, and I met my uh, predecessor, Chris Wilder, and many of the dear friends and colleagues that I have today, and I've never left San Jose, and I've fallen in love with this city and its people and its community and its culture and its possibilities. Um, I live near Bequesto Park with my wife, Jessica, who's a public school teacher here in San Jose. I have two daughters. I have a sophomore uh, just down the street at Notre Dame, and I have a fifth grader. Um, I also serve on the board of the Create TV and, and the Healthier Kids Foundation, and I'm a youth soccer ref. And yes, I miss a lot of calls because my eyesight um, is terrible. The, the, joining this is not complicated. I found in my life, um, find good people that want to do good in your community and invest in those relationships and see what good can come of that. So I'm excited to invest in all of you, and I hope I do a good job. I think next week I'm signed up for bartending at the uh, barbecue. I'm excited about that. A, a real missed opportunity in my life. I always wanted to be a bartender, and I never got that job. So this is an exciting moment for me. Um, I won't screw it up. I won't screw it up. I'm going to be excellent. Um, so thank you for the, for the very warm welcome, uh, and that's all. Thank you. We're going to get a picture of something. Okay, thank you. See, very painless, very painless. So next, I want to bring up uh, Tu Do to talk about, you know, this amazing Vietnam trip that uh, many of our members took uh, to honor our former member, our late member, Roy Russell, too, can you come up and tell, talk to us about it. Thank you, President Sal. Hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure to report to you the completion of the school construction project in Vietnam to honor the legacy of our Roy Russell, who passed away in January 2021. I led a group of 16 people, including Rotarians and their, sp their spouses, to attend the school opening ceremony in August. I have summarized all the major activities of the event in a short video that you are going to see in a minute. And after the video, some trip members will share with you their most memorable moments in Vietnam. And here is the video. <laughs> điểm trường tiểu học trường Đông A thuộc điểm bản Na Pản với 204 cháu học sinh nó thực sự vất vả khi đó có 6 lớp và trong đó có 3 phòng học đã xuống cấp cộng với 4 phòng học tạm chỉ là nhà gỗ vách đất và lập vào xi măng thực sự vất vả cho thầy và trò nhà trường thầy trò nhà trường được đón một cái công trình tài trợ của các tổ chức từ thiện thì các con đã có cái điểm trường rất là khang trang đảm bảo về cơ sở vật chất cho thầy và trò dạy và học VN Health tính đến năm nay đã xây được tất cả là 70 ngôi trường và tại tỉnh Sơn La này chúng tôi đã xây đây là ngôi trường thứ bảy tại tỉnh Sơn La của quý vị ở đây sau đó chúng tôi cũng mong là quý vị nhận ra rằng 
Chúng tôi tuy ở xa nhưng tấm lòng và trái tim của chúng tôi vẫn luôn luôn hướng về quê hương Việt Nam và luôn luôn muốn đóng góp một cái gì đó hữu hiệu, tích cực cho đồng bào ta tại quê nhà. Và ngoài những người Việt Nam hướng về quê hương của chúng ta, chúng ta còn có những người bạn nước ngoài, họ cũng rất là có lòng hảo tâm và cùng đóng góp với tổ chức VNL của chúng tôi. So I'm sure that Roy, who passed away last year, is up there looking down on us with great joy in his heart, same as I have. This is my first trip to Vietnam, and I hope it's not going to be my last. I have been so impressed with the people here, with the warmth and the hospitality that they have shown us. And it has been such a pleasure to be here for the grand opening of the Roy Russell School. I'm sure that Roy would be so pleased with everything he has seen here. Uh, the architect has done a beautiful job with the school, and as a matter of fact, it is shaped in the letter R for Roy, specifically for Roy, which is very special to all of us. So it's R for Roy and R for Rotary, uh, which is a wonderful combination. I am uh, very happy that we were able to partner with VN Help. They've been wonderful to work with. And um, I think the best part was giving out the backpacks and the candy that we brought to the children because it brought smiles to their faces. And the, the warmth that they showed, it was just, just wonderful. So I, I thank from, you know, from the Rotary Club of San Jose, I thank the people of Vietnam for allowing us this opportunity to come and bring our two countries together board member of the San Jose Rotary Club, also the president of the International Service Committee. And coming to the school today, it's really touching. It makes me realize that kids are kids, no matter where you go in the world, the parents just want the best for their children and education. And we're so happy to be part of this. And I hope the kids have fun learning here and inspires them to continue their education and become leaders in the community here. Chúng tôi rất là vui mừng và cảm động nhìn thấy thầy trò và các phụ huynh đến rất đông ngày hôm nay. Khi con người có những kiến thức căn bản thì là họ sẽ có thể tự vươn lên. Khi họ được học hỏi những điều mới lạ thì họ sẽ cố gắng tự vượt khó. Thì chúng tôi nghĩ là các cháu nếu mà các cháu có điều kiện được đi học từ thuở bé các cháu sẽ có cơ hội lớn dần với thời gian với kiến thức mà các cháu học được thì hy vọng các cháu sẽ đem sự hiểu biết của mình để tự lo cho bản thân mình lo cho gia đình và lo cho cộng đồng đó là ý nghĩ của chúng tôi với cái kiến thức các cháu được học tập các cháu sẽ phải tự tự vươn lên some of the members of the committee that were on the trip. Not quite yet. Okay, sorry. Um, so one memorable part of our visit to Vietnam was when we visited a village uh, in the highlands. Uh, the village was on a steep slope uh, with a road going down to rice fields at the bottom of the valley. At the bottom of the valley lived a, a Hmong community and where we visited an older woman in her home. And the home was a one room house on stilts uh, with a bamboo floor uh, that was a little bit rickety. There was a simple dresser in the house and a poster sized photograph of her grandson at his wedding. Uh, there was also, there was very little other furniture, but there was a refrigerator and a flat screen TV. So it was quite a study in contrast. And as I said, the village was at the bottom of a slope. Uh, to persuade Linda Price, the best way to get back to the top was on the back of a scooter uh, holding on tightly to her Hmong driver. So that was another very memorable sight. Thank you. I am Dennis. I'll make it short and sweet. Um, from the minute I landed at the airport in Hanoi, the most important thing I re realized and saw was the energy of the people, the Vietnamese people. And to the day I left, when I flew out of the airport, it was the same hustle and bustle. And what impressed me, this is a country 
that is going to break into the 21st, 22nd century at full speed ahead. Um, it can be amazing how these people, after all these decades and decades of turmoil, can be so positive about the future. And that's why building into school is so important. It adds to the momentum to a positive future. And to make it work better, we bought candy. And it was a fantastic diplomacy. If we had started giving candy out instead of bullets out, the world would be at peace. Cheers to candy. So you've heard a little bit about the people that we met and some of the places that we went. But um, I have to say it's a very long trip to get to Vietnam. And it was a long trip to go up the mountain to see the school. And it, there was a storm. <laughs> it was raining. And yet we're in our cozy bus going up the hill. And the villagers or people who live nearby are riding their scooters in this torrential downpour. Um, it, it was an experience we'll never forget. But one thing that really struck me, um, you saw in the video that this is the seventh school they built in Son La, uh, Van Help, Two's organization. But it's actually the 71st school that she built in Vietnam. And we are so happy in the international committee to pair with Two, which we've done several projects over the years. And I am just amazed, um, distant she has to travel, the climate that she is working in, um, all the work she's done, and we are very proud to partner with her. So, Sandra didn't mention the fact that there were rock slides on, we we're going up that hillside in the rain. Um, my strongest memory uh, is, is obviously of Roy Russell, who we named the school for, it's in his honor. And uh, for years, he had gone to Vietnam, he'd done wonderful work there. My wife and I had gone 2006 on a wheelchair trip to Vietnam. So uh, Roy Russell was really the most memorable part of the, the uh, trip for me. There was also an evening that two organized a dinner, a very formal dinner, at the top of our, uh, our hotel. And the ambassador, US ambassador to Vietnam, to Hanoi, came and spoke, spoke to us. And also, the, uh, the future director of the Peace Corps program in, in Vietnam, who happens to be the son of our member, um, um, uh, Silver. Um, Gary Silver, sorry. And I talked to Gary when we got back, and he was very happy that we, we got to, uh, to meet with him. And finally, uh, we had a wonderful uh, evening on a, on a ship, on a, on a cruise boat, overlooking the uh, Halung Bay. It was a chance to have a happy hour and uh, spend that time with my wife. So thank you. Thank you, Mark Dennis, Sandra, and Mike. I'd like to conclude our report by my sincere gratitude to the support and collaboration of the International Service Committee and the financial contributions from many members of this Rotary Club and the Rotary Club of Alameda and uh, Roy Russell's family and friends. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all and what a great example of the work and power Rotary can have throughout the world. Now for an example of the work that Rotary can have right here in our community. Let's uh, bring up Tim Well, this is also around the world. Tim Gill. Good afternoon, everybody, and President Sal. We just heard how we, can, how we supported uh, a school in Vietnam. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about how you can help support schools in El Salvador. Uh, let the good times roll. Uh, that's President Sal's theme for the year. And you can do that by attending the uh, International Feast on October 7th at the Gordon House. Uh, we're going to have the new deck. It's all going to be decorated for a very festive atmosphere. We're going to have entertainment. We're going to have a guitarist who's going to play uh, El Salvadorian music. We're going to have a piñata, so anybody that wants to can take a whack at that. Uh, we're going to have international foods from around the world and also beer and wine. Uh, I am dressed in Lederhosen today. Uh, I just got back from Munich, and they're setting up for the Oktoberfest, which is starting Saturday. Uh, so we're going to have some German sausages, uh, we're going to have raffle prizes. We're going to have maybe some sharks tickets, movie dinner passes, 
uh, bottles of wine, and uh, the odds are going to be pretty good. I, I was talking to Mike Conniff. He wants to have 60 raffle prizes, so if we have 60 people attending, the odds are pretty good. Um, so not only can you have a lot, lots of fun, as I mentioned, uh, every year the International Service Committee wants to support a particular project. This year we have chosen to, uh, the pr proceeds are going to help uh, schools get a satellite internet uh, connection at a cost of $2,000 per school. So uh, we want to uh, be able to do that as many schools as possible. Um, El Salvador is a very poor country. Only 33% of the uh, children go on to secondary school. There's a lot of uh, gang violence, which affects the social fabric of the country, the economic growth, and, and also just the safety of the people in the community. And we feel if we can keep more kids in school, we can just maybe eradicate some of that uh, gang violence. So in conclusion, uh, you're, uh, bring all your family, friends, Rotarians, and sign up and come to it. It's a lot of fun. And as I said, the proceeds are going to uh, go to help support that school. But you can't get a better deal in town if, you know, for 60 bucks, all the food you can eat and drink. So you can sign up in the foyer or, or online. So I will see you at the feast. And afterwards, please sign up. Thank you very much. I went last year. I'm going this year. It should be a great time. Next, we're in speed round territory. So let's bring up Sarah Klish to quickly talk about our Lee Warmer's Virgin Artist Awards. So. On October 12th, we'll be celebrating, can you believe it, the 10th anniversary, folks, 10th anniversary. And um, we want to thank Rotary Club Foundation, as well as previous funders who got things started, Knight Foundation, Valley Community Foundation, and many of the individuals in this room. With the previous support, we have been able to give out 48 awards since the founding. Those awards ranged from 16 micro grants that we did during the horrible dark days of the pandemic to $5,000 awards that we give out to the regular recipients of the program. With this year's awardees, it will be 52 recipients from this particular committee over the last 10 years. Um, from dresses to can made of candy wrappers to storytelling wrappers to a rap jingle written specifically for SJ Rotary, Lee Weimers has been recognizing uh, our emerging artists in virtually every aspect of the arts, actors, musicians, playwrights, painters, sculptors, quilters, dancers, comedians, composers, choreographers, filmmakers, and lighting designers. Why am I telling you all of this? Because this is the best program of the year, folks. You get to see some amazingly talented people, but they need to see all of your faces at the meeting on October 12th. It's a field trip. We're not doing it here. We're going to the hammer and it's not just you all. We want your friends, Romans, countrymen, your dog. Oh, I don't think the hammer will let the dog in. But anyway, um, they can make a reservation by going to Eventbrite. Yes, we're moving into the 21st century. You can Google, or I'll go on to Eventbrite, I should say, and go Lee Weimers, boom, it'll pop up. You can forward that to anybody. It's free. So let us fill that theater and come out and celebrate. Great. I'm looking forward to being there, too. So we're about to get to our speaker, but very quickly, uh, let me just remind you that next week's meeting is on Monday at the Hilton, at Signia by Hilton Hotel. We're going to have Janine Pelosi, Chief Marketing Officer of Zoom, speaking to us. Uh, you need to sign up for lunch, and you need to do it today. Today is the last day we can sign up for lunch. We need to get a final count to the uh, hotel. You guys have been great. We have over 100 members signed up. To attend that lunch, hope to see as many of you there as possible. I'd also like to remind you that we've got the fall barbecue the very next day on uh, Tuesday, September 20th. We're working on having a jazz band there. Uh, it should be great. Members of the Large Club Conference are going to be there. And last, I would like to, uh, again, thank the Cub Scouts for being here. They take cash and credit on your way out if you want to buy some popcorn. And now... <sighs> Barbara Marshman, can you come up and introduce a man who probably needs no introduction after 16 years? Thank you, President Sal. Hi, Sam. Remember me? <laughs> um, I actually remember Sam from his first 
interview with the Mercury News editorial board in 2006 when he was running for the open downtown city council seat. Um, interestingly, the member who had been termed out of that seat was Cindy Chavez. Just a little small town note. Um, the editorial board recommended Sam at that time, and, and if I'm not mistaken, every time he's run for office since. Uh, if I am mistaken about that or anything else, you can be sure I'll hear about it. Um, as mayor, uh, Sam Licardo has pursued goals, including setting city financing straight, attracting jobs, and making free high-speed internet available to disadvantaged neighborhoods. His most visible accomplishments are reflected in downtown San Jose's thousands of new homes and the Google plan now taking shape. Some of the mayor's initiatives have met with, let's just say, resistance from city council members. Um, and at times, that has improved them. But one that has been extremely important to me personally has, has been popular with the council and with voters. And that is the city's partnership with open space groups to preserve 1,200 acres in the Coyote Valley, not just for wildlife, but as infrastructure. Thank you. <laughs> See, I told you. It's popular. Um, not just for wildlife, but as infrastructure, as flood control, and as a safe water uh, initiative. That is seen nationally and internationally, I am told, as breakthrough thinking for a mayor, particularly by a pro-business mayor. Please welcome, now my friend, since I'm not a journalist anymore, Sam Licardo. Well, good afternoon. It's great to be with you all again. Great to be back at Rotary. Uh, thanks for having me. Although I have to say, coming on the day when Tim Gill dresses up in Lederhosen, it's all downhill from there. Uh, it's a little hard to top that. Thank you, Bob, for the very kind introduction, and thank you for your friendship. Um, so uh, in my final opportunity to address you as mayor of the greatest Rotary Club in the Western Hemisphere, I guess universe, I guess I have to say that still, I'm elected. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. Our city is a better place because of Rotary. And whether it's in the form of Rotacare or a play garden or uh, programs with, Western, uh, with Washington Elementary students or what you're doing all across the world, um, on behalf of a grateful city, I want to say to each and every one of you, thank you for your service above self. Uh, I, in this circumstance, of course, any outgoing politician might think that they can just give a speech uh, that shamelessly catalogs whatever it is they think they've accomplished in their tenure and boring the hell out of the audience in the meantime. That, of course, is exactly what I plan to do. Uh, I notice I'm honored, honored to be joined by our Vice Mayor, Chappie Jones. Thanks for being here. Chappie, yes. Naturally, he'll give the rebuttal in a moment uh, and correct whatever I say, it's wrong. Uh, but you know, rather than, than dwelling on the past, what I'd really like to talk about is the future. Uh, there are, as always, many urgent issues of the day that are top of mind, and I'm happy to talk about any of those during our question and answer session. Hopefully, we'll have time. Uh, but what I really want to focus these prepared remarks on is our future, because often in the hustle and bustle, we know these aren't the issues that make the headlines, they don't provide clickbait, but they're incredibly important to the long-term quality of life of our community. So the future, and I'm looking for a clicker at this time. Should I be looking at the keyboard? OK, sure. I'll just click along here. OK, great. All right, I'll see. Look at that. That's great. Um, so the future, as the great playwright Luis Valdez tells us, belongs to those who can imagine it. And I was reminded about those words when I was part of a, a group of young adults who were part of the San Jose Conservation Corps in a cleanup along Coyote Creek uh, just a couple Fridays ago. About a dozen Corps members performed maintenance and caretaking there, transforming a blighted stretch 
of that creek filled with trash and encampments into a restored recreational trail. And when I'm around a, a group of, of young people, usually I try to find the quiet one uh, and see if I can bring him or her out a little bit. And in this case, there was a young woman, uh, I'll call her Natalia. She was in her early 20s, but I could tell from our conversation that, uh, and certainly from my experience with troubled youth, that she had probably had more experience and endured much more than people twice her age. Uh, she fled a, a Midwest city as, as a teen, escaping a dead end job. And she came to San Jose because for her it represented a brighter future, a better life. She was, she was taking classes with the Conservation Corps and then joining the group and helping to preserve and beautify the creek. And she really appreciated having this fresh start and she aspired to become a teacher. And young adults like Natalia really inspire me. They offer models of resilience that our community so desperately needs. They also persuade us of the importance of our investment in their future. Two years ago, we took a page from the Conservation Corps to create the San Jose Resilience Corps, which employs, no, maybe not, it employs uh, almost 500 young adults, all coming from struggling neighborhoods and supporting communities' resilience in various ways. They're supporting uh, food distribution, vaccination, tutoring children who are struggling with learning loss, drought mitigation, wildfire prevention. And it's this kind of imagining that Valdez urges. And we don't do nearly enough of it. Rather, we live in an age afflicted by temporal myopia. <clears throat> if you haven't heard of that disease, temporal myopia, it's because I just invented it. Temporal myopia is the short-term thinking that undermines our long-term quality of life. And it's every bit as lethal as COVID. Temporal myopia has us consuming fossil fuels at an unsustainable rate, underfunding a social security system that will go bankrupt in about 13 years. We underinvest in child education. We overinvest in prisons. And here in San Jose, our children will continue paying about a $4 billion unfunded retirement liability created by decisions to appease powerful groups about two decades ago, and leaving us with the most thinly staffed city hall of any big city in the country. So too in everyday life. This isn't just in politics. We know corporate executives are obsessed, uh, I think mandated in many ways, to be focused on quarterly results to appease Wall Street. TV papers and blogs fill the news cycle with clickbait. Oh, great. Thanks, Sal. Uh, we know that the, the news is filled and the news cycle is filled with clickbait to the exclusion often of in-depth reporting because of a need to be so focused in the moment. We all compulsively react to the tweet and the text that's incoming on our phones as a substitute for perhaps more thoughtful conversation. And to be sure, plenty of crises do demand our urgent attention, and we've had plenty of them in recent years. We can all talk about the pandemic. <clears throat> mass shootings, civil unrest, flood, drought, power outages, fires. But San Jose is not going to perish from any of these crises. I think we've demonstrated time and time again how we can pull together to overcome them. We will perish, though, if we fail to look to the future and fail to focus, fail to save, fail to sacrifice, to invest. This is the great lesson of the many immigrant families who have built the city, sacrifice for their children's future. So in my tenure, I'm proud of the many ways that we as a city have heeded that imperative of the immigrant ethos to focus on the future. I'd like to talk today about just four dimensions of that future. There are many others, certainly I'm happy to chat about in the Q&A. But I wanna focus on our money, our unhoused, our planet, and our children. So first, let's talk about our money, specifically your money, the money that you pay in taxes to support city services. When I took office in 2015, my retirement costs had quadrupled over the prior decade. <clears throat> and the city was still lacking, licking its wounds from the Great Recession, divisive battles over pension reform. And we lost nearly 1,000 employees through layoffs and defections and pay cuts and hiring freezes. And our residents felt it acutely. You felt it acutely. You saw it in city services lagging emergency response times, shuttered libraries, and our basic city infrastructure was also deteriorating in many ways. 
streetlight outages, roads that hadn't been repaved in decades. We work together, though. We work together with our community, with our hardworking city workforce, local businesses, and there was a spirit of shared sacrifice. Our city team found innovative ways to do more with less. And five times our voters approved of measures at the ballot box to address these challenges in different ways, settling pension battles, increasing revenues. And certainly a lot more work lies ahead. But I'm proud that we've certainly made some important gains. We've expanded the San Jose Police Department by more than 200 officers in the last few years, the levels of staffing not seen in a decade. And we are now at a vacancy rate of only 3%, contrary to what you might hear from some in the media. Uh, we've substantially reduced emergency medical response times in our fire department. We've restored library hours, and for the first time, libraries will be open on Sundays in 13 of our least affluent neighborhoods. We're going to repave more than 300 street miles of roads this year, which is about four times as many as we repaved in 2015. We've retrofitted almost every single street light in the city. That's more than 60,000 street lights with LEDs, which has dramatically reduced our outages. And we're either constructing or have just completed a host of critical facilities, including emergency operations center, wastewater facility, drainage pumps in El Viso, five fire stations. The list goes on and on. And that's because you as voters, thank you, were willing to sacrifice to help us do those things. And our community pulled together. And at the root of it is that we're getting our financial house in order. We've eliminated longstanding city debt on golf courses and hotels and other non-essential assets. We've raised the city's bond rating now. It's the second highest of any big city in the country. For the first time in two decades, we've reduced and are reducing the required annual payment to the city's retirement costs every single year. And as a result, for the first time in the 21st century, we can say the city's budget office has projected modest surpluses for the next half decade. Thank you. And thank you for putting up with a lot of challenging years till we could say that. And we haven't been doing it simply by cutting uh, and by raising taxes. We know we've, we've certainly had to do a lot of that in years past. But we're pushing for a third way, and that is growing revenues by growing jobs. And it's more than just Google. Since 2015, we've seen the expansion of numerous employers in San Jose, including familiar names like Adobe and Amazon, Apple, Ruben Networks, Broadcom, Micron, Microsoft, NetApp, Roku, Supermicro, Yahoo, Western Digital, and Zoom. Uh, just to name a few. And all of those companies have one thing in common. None of them got a dime of your money, either in tax breaks or subsidies. We're also learning how to do more with less. Since the launch of our Smart City Vision in 2016, our city workforce is increasingly leveraging technology and data to improve our services. For everything from emergency medical response to garbage pickup, airport security, food distribution, and much more. More than 40 kinds of building permits can now be gotten online, so you don't have to wait in line at City Hall. We know there's enough of that. Uh, and we've launched the Smart City Initiative in 2016 with the goal of really becoming the most innovative city in the country. We've got a lot more work to do, but the good news is others are recognizing our work. In the Digital, Surveys, Digital City Survey, uh, we were number one in the country in both 2020 and 2021. So we're making some progress. And of course, there's a lot more work to do. But for the first time in some time, we can say the next mayor in our community will have the resources to do more and to dream bigger. And I know they will. So secondly, I'd like to talk about our unhoused. And certainly, our homelessness crisis is the greatest crisis we face. And it hasn't been solved unlike some of our budget challenges. But I'd like to believe, though, after many years of wheel spinning, we're finally getting traction on some solutions. This morning, I spoke with, with Governor Newsom. We were at an event announcing his signing of the Care Court legislation, which I think is going to be critically important. I know Scott and Easton and others have been pushing hard for these kinds of solutions for many years to enable us to get mentally ill individuals who are struggling mightily off the street and into treatment. <clears throat> 
Some critics uh, cling to the refrain that homelessness isn't really about housing, it's about, <laughs> oof, excuse me. It's not really about housing, it's about mental health or it's about drug addiction. But the reality is it's about all those things. It's about all those things. And we know, and certainly those who are in the treatment business tell me that they can't do anything to help somebody who's a meth addict or schizophrenic while they're living under a bridge. So we definitely need the housing. So I'm gonna focus on the housing for that reason, because the reality is in California, cities actually don't have any jurisdiction, authority, state or federal funding, treatment or staff or expertise to deal with mental health or drug treatment. That all happens at the county and state level. So we try to stay in our lanes, focus on the housing, although we have been spending money on mental health, uh, simply because the, the direness of the need. Uh, but we're going to continue to focus on how we can build the housing and work with the county to ensure the services are provided as well. Now, getting housing built has been a challenge enough. And if we look at the county's Measure A in 2016 as an example, which was a historic achievement, to be sure, uh, six years later, the county has issued almost all of its bonds, nearly $700 million, and we have 711 units completed for the formerly homeless in a county with about 10,000 unhoused residents. Now, let me be clear. I'm not blaming the county. It's not the county's fault. The reality is that the construction in the Bay Area, where apartments in the Bay Area cost more than $800,000 per unit to build, more than half a dozen years typically to get under construction and finished, we are simply not going to solve this problem doing things the same way. The long view tells us that housing 10,000 people would require the equivalent of about 10 measure A's in several decades. So obviously this crisis demands a more nimble response, something more cost effective, what we can do while the permanent housing is getting built. So in 2016, we pioneered something called motel conversions, focusing on a couple deteriorating motels in our downtown on the Alameda. And we found we could convert those motels for housing apartments at about a third of the cost, of typical construction, and a whole lot faster. The governor loved the idea. Uh, they are trying it in LA as well. Soon Project Home Key emerged. And as a result of that, and we're grateful for the governor's and the state's emphasis on it, we've now been able to fund three more projects with a fourth on its way. They'll add another 209 apartments just in the last year and a half. But we've been experimenting with other models as well, tiny homes, ADUs, and others. The most promising approach, I think, lies what I call quick build housing communities. When the pandemic hit, we had to quickly build units to protect medically vulnerable residents of congregate homeless shelters. And so we had to move them into separate bedrooms and separate bathrooms. <clears throat> and so we piloted this, the construction of these prefabricated uh, dorms. We call, or I call quick build housing communities at a cost of a little less than $100,000 per unit. We built them in a matter of months, not of years. And we now have moved, uh, as of last week, 663 residents off the street and about 82% of them remain housed. So this year, the council, and I see council member David Cohen uh, also in the audience, and I think I heard that council member Matt Mahan may be here as well. Uh, there he is, he's in the back. Uh, the council unanimously agreed that we needed to commit more money to this effort, so we committed $40 million. And we've now got hundreds more units under construction, and our goal is to have 1,000 pandemic era units complete or under development this year. And by the way, thank you, Councilmember Mayhan, for your leadership in actually identifying a site in your own district so we can move ahead with more than 200 units. So combined, <laughs> these initiatives are scaling up an inventory of transitional housing that can accelerate our efforts to transform the unhoused to housed. And we're doing so at the fraction of the time and a fraction of the cost of traditional apartment construction. There's no quick fix here. We know this is going to take time, but at least we think we have finally are landing on an approach. We've got to move more nimbly while the permanent housing is getting built. So third, I'd like to talk about our planet. I think we all know well of the future threat. It's rarely apparent. We've all experienced the smoke from the fires, the heat, the drought. And this threat also presents San Jose with a unique leadership opportunity. We live in a world where 70% of our 
greenhouse gas emissions come from cities. And so if San Jose can demonstrate climate action that can actually make a difference, we can literally change the world because let's face it, all mayors steal ideas from each other. So in San Jose, we started by greening our grid. And in 2016, I'm sorry, 2018, we launched, I'll talk about water another time. All right, <laughs> we, we launched San Jose Clean Energy, uh, which is a utility that has given residents and businesses a choice of greener sources of electricity and today zero emission sources such as wind, solar, and hydro, uh, hydroelectric uh, comprise 95% of electricity that you are getting if you are a resident or a business in the city of San Jose. Uh, San Jose has now the highest rate of zero carbon energy among the largest cities in the country and we're two decades ahead of schedule of the state's target to get to zero carbon energy in 2045. I suspect, since uh, Sal is approaching, is that I'm well behind schedule, though, uh, in terms of uh, speaking. So you want to get to Q&A? Yeah. OK, all right. So I guess we're just going to skip kids and the rest of this stuff, and let's just go to Q&A. <laughs> yeah, you guys didn't want to hear the rest of that speech. Let's go to Q&A. You know, if you can catch the state of the city next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much better. There'll be better jokes, I promise. Do you, do you want uh, just call on people? Uh, you know, why don't you do it, Sal? So. OK, stand up if you've got questions. Right here, Dave. Hi, Dave. Uh, uh, quick question, and it seems like you're moving and have moved this uh, 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 city in a great direction, but the state legislature seems to be getting in the way all the way along. Uh, in each of those points, uh, it seems there's great concern for that. Where would you see that direction going in the city working more closely with its many state legislatures to move, uh, for example, the green energy and the fact that uh, solar homes can't uh, expect to do something without paying ridiculous taxes that are going to be proposed by the PUC, as yeah. an example. Uh, well, first, I should say, since I just celebrated the signing of important state legislation this morning with the governor, it's probably a bad time for me to, to diss the state legislature, uh, because that was really important legislation to help us really get. Yeah, they signed it. OK, now I can just, OK, fine. Um, and the, the reality is, you know, look, every, every mayor wants more money. We all want more flexibility. And, and the good news is, I think increasing legislature recognizes the need, particularly around homelessness, to get dollars to, to local communities. Um, I think there are great opportunities that we had, not just with state legislature, but with Congress. Yesterday, I was at the White House where we um, the president had signed uh, a little bill you guys have all heard of. Uh, whether it reduces inflation or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know is it can dramatically reduce your utility costs. And all of our utility bills have been skyrocketing, I know. Uh, a 30 percent tax credit for solar, uh, a 50 to 100 percent rebate on any energy efficiency you might, uh, appliances you might uh, install in your home, such as an electric heat pump or a uh, water heater, other kinds of devices, that's really important because what we're really challenged by and as we think about climate uh, is not so much the new stuff. I mean, we've been leading the country in terms of, for example, mandating all electric new construction. Um, Mark Lazzarini probably isn't thrilled, uh, or I, well, actually, Mark, I don't mean to suggest how you feel, but some of the builders may not be thrilled. Uh, but the, the challenge is, is that 99% of our city is built out, and we have to go retrofit all the homes and all the office buildings that have already been built and make them greener, and that's really hard and really hard work. So I think this legislation that just passed is going to be super helpful to enable all of us as ordinary folks to be able to uh, benefit from the green dividend. Uh, we don't have to be able to afford a Tesla. You actually can get $4,000 now under the federal legislation to buy a used electric vehicle. And my Chevy Volt is now 10 years old, so it's a good So device. that's definitely used. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's definitely used. That it hasn't been washed either. So. Why don't we go to the back here to Jeff? Yeah. Greetings, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jeff Poley with Southern Lumber Company. Um, I'm working on the new website for our Enterprise Leadership Conference, uh, of which I know you were a participant many years ago because my father was your discussion group leader. Do you have oh any? Oh gosh, I was a teenager. Yeah. A long time ago. Yes. Do you have any wonderful uh, epiphanies or things like that that I could get a testimonial from you on as I uh, you know, work I on? Talk offline. It's a little pressure right now. Standing on stage, <laughs> to come up with a big epiphany. All right, how so, about a fun story then? And I'll come up with something more creative than I probably will at this moment. 
Jerk. <laughs> and over here to a guy I think you know pretty well. Hey, Steve. He's a neighbor of mine, by the way. Uh, Property Sam. values have skyrocketed since he moved in. <laughs> uh, Sam, thanks for working hard for all, all of us for the last 16 years. We really, really appreciate thanks. your friendship. Uh, uh, who are you going to support for mayor and why? Oh, that's okay. Wow. All right, I can say. Uh, well, that happens to be a council member sitting in the back, Matt Mahan, who I think is a pretty bright guy, uh, and I appreciate the fact that, thank you. Uh, I know we're not supposed to make this stuff political, but uh, I'll just summarize in a few words. Look, I, I think being a mayor, and look, I don't pretend to have had the diversity of experience it all requires, but running a company, uh, teaching students in East San Jose, uh, working in, in South America, help building irrigation. I mean, those are the kinds of diversity experiences that are really valuable, I think, as an elected leader in a city as diverse as ours. And um, I think he's going to do a good job. He's twice as smart as I am. Okay, do we have, David, are you asking a question? David Cohen, no, no. Do we have any other questions here in the audience? Oh, Norm Klein, great. Hey, Norm. Thanks, Sam, for the last 16 years. And uh, thanks for, um, I guess you were in Washington, D.C. yesterday trying to get more money for us. You must be tired. Yeah, I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just one quick question. Uh, what's the biggest challenge San Jose faces in the next five to ten years? Biggest challenge. One. one. Yeah, it's, it's homelessness. I think you know, we, we see it every single day. Um, the dark horse candidate would be drought, and I think we all know how real that is. So. A lot more needs to be done on homelessness, no question. I think one thing we're starting to see, though, is the last couple of years, I mean, we know in the long view, as we think about what happens with the unhoused, we've got to find ways to help them get back on their feet. It's not just about putting people in housing. Uh, if we can enable them to be working again, that's, you know, that's the gold standard, right? So we've been working with the good, with Goodwill. It's done an incredible job in San Jose Bridge. More than 150 unhoused residents who are now cleaning our city, beautifying our city. And in some cases, picking up trash, sometimes it's much more than that. Uh, but now we've gotten more than 40 of them permanent jobs, I should say Goodwill has, as they're doing the heavy lifting. And we're expanding the program. And so I think we've got to think beyond the housing. We've got to find ways to help those who are on house get back into the community. Get back. And they want to be. You know, they want to be. We've got more than 500 unhoused residents who are living in encampments right now who are actually cleaning up their own encampment areas and other parts of the city and, and, and leaving trash bags out for the city because they want to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And we actually started this partnership now with MasterCard where they can get dollars <coughs> provided on, on debit cards that they can use. They can use them at a liquor store. It's interesting. It's great technology. They can use them for food and basic necessities. But it shows there's an enormous desire of these women and men to be part of the solution. They don't want to be pointed yeah. as being the, the problem. And, and I think we can do that. Great. Last quick question have, here from yes. Mandy. Yes. Hi, Mayor Sam. Thank you for your service for all these years. It's been great. But I wanted to ask, remember that program you did with David Cortezzi, All the Way Home? Yeah. What, what, what became of that program? Is it still alive? Yeah. This is helping veterans be ho get housed in Thank homes. You. Yeah. Yeah, and I just Please. talked to Senator Cortezzi this morning. Uh, yeah. So, um, so yes, the, 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 the agency that has really been leading the way, Destination Home, led by Jennifer Loving, has done amazing work. And she's the one who kind of crafted the strategy. And we were all just happy to jump up and support and share in any way we could. So they continued the work. Um, they re I believe they reported that they achieved functional, functional um, zero when it comes to homelessness for veterans uh, about two years ago, two and a half years ago. So they continued the effort. What does functional zero mean? Well, it means that we're actually housing people faster than they're getting pushed out the door, enough to get to a zero point. But you know, inevitably, with this economy, more people are going to get pushed out the door. So yes, there's still homeless vets. But um, they're able to actually get them housed now because of bash vouchers and a whole lot of other work that's been done with lots of landlords who stepped up. And really, credit goes to Jennifer, but also to Senator Cortese. OK. Well Steve Allenberg, last like 30 seconds. Since I was the person that arranged uh, Hi, Steve, thanks Utica, for thanks, for, thanks yeah. for being here, Sam, and Thank thanks you. for your, your years of service. I, I want to correct, I, I don't know if it's a correction, but I want to I make sure that, that the group doesn't leave with a false sense that you were in somehow poo-pooing, uh, that's a Yiddish term, 
uh, measure measure A. No, I actually, and I want to let I people know. I want to let people know people that there are 965 units now open, 1,164 units of permanent supportive housing opening in, by the end of 2023, and 2,644 additional units of permanent supportive housing. That, will, that are currently in the pipeline. It has been a wonderful thing, and it's not something that we should poo-poo. And I'm, in, in case you were suggesting that, yeah. I just want to make it clear Thank you, Steve. my position on yeah, this. Yeah, I understand. Thank, thank you <laughs> for and, the clarification. And I'll be clear, Steve. I was one of the first people I actually stood there when we, they announced it at the county to support it. I'm not poo-pooing it. I'm saying if, if that's the only horse we ride, we're not going to solve this crisis. And I think we recognize that. The resources are too great, and the time is too long. So we've got, we just need more solutions. We need more tools in the toolbox. And we all got to push on that. Now, before we let you go, I think everyone would be happy if I did ask the question nobody asked, which is, what are you going to do next? All right, here's the big announcement. I got to go get a real job and work for a living. Any you guys hiring? All right. Available Thank January you. 1st. Right, thank, thank you, Sam. You spent... You spent yesterday. You spent yesterday with the president, this morning with the governor, and this afternoon with us. Isn't that great? Thank you all, Sam. As you know, or Mayor Licardo, uh, a donation has been made in your name to the San Jose Jazz Jazz Aid Fund to help musicians right here in San Jose. And then please be back next Monday. Janine Pelosi speaking at the Signia. Be aware, parking at the fair at the Signia Hotel is twenty-six dollars, so you don't want to park there. We'll see you all next week. Keep the good times rolling.